16. And we're going to pause for a moment while you're turning there. Uh, let's, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you so much that we have that freedom in you, that we can praise you anytime, anywhere, that we can lift our voices and say, Jesus is Lord, that we can lift our voices and point people to salvation through Jesus, that we have that freedom to follow you and do what you call us to do because your Holy Spirit resides in us. And so we thank you for that, and we thank you for the songs that we've been able to sing today and praise to you and to express our desire to just sit in your presence, to just be with you. Now, Lord, as we move into this time of looking into your word, we pray that you, with us here, you will open our eyes, that you will speak to us, make your word come alive, and let it speak to what we are going through right now in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we continue in What's Next, Lord, in our study of Acts. We're in chapter 16. We are more than halfway through. Woohoo! <laughs> we are making our, our way through. And I just want to um, uh, give a, a couple shout outs here um, while we're uh, waiting, waiting to get into the word here. Yesterday, we had. Car after car after car after truck after truck after car after truck come through, <laughs> and we were able to provide food boxes for about 200 families here in Williams County, and uh, that was my first rodeo doing this. Okay, and uh, but uh, thankful for uh, Grace Cares. Yes, thank you. Thankful for Grace Cares and all the work that they've put into this, and uh, Stephanie heads that up, and we are just so uh, happy to be able to, to minister to people in, in tangible ways like this. And also, along with Grace Cares, our Revive Ohio team members were here as well from our church, as well as other teams, uh, or other uh, people from other, other churches. And they were able to pray with people while they were in line and to get their, their food boxes. And it was a, a really, really blessed time. And people uh, were very, very grateful. And so thank you for all the, the, the donations that you give to Grace Cares and how you support that as a church here. And uh, thank you for all who helped out yesterday with loading the boxes into the cars uh, there were people checking people in as well. I got to run around uh, the, the, the road here and just make sure everybody had their papers with them. And if they didn't, give them papers so they could fill them out and turn them in, that kind of stuff. So that it was a, a great time of, of blessing our community. So we thank uh, Grace Cares and also our Revive Ohio team as well. Now, as we said, we're more than halfway through the book of Acts. Um, and next week, what's happening next week? First Sunday of December. Yeah. Wow. It, it's, <laughs> you know, Christmas is coming up. And so we're going to take a break from our Acts uh, series of what's next, Lord. And we're going to put a pause on that for the month of December. We'll come back to it for chapter 17 on the first Sunday in January. But next Sunday, we're going to uh, go into a, a, a series of sermons leading up to Christmas, and that's what Advent is. Advent is the advent of Christmas, the awaiting, the, the coming of Christmas. That's what Advent means, the coming of Christmas. So that's what we're going to be doing, a, a sermon series on Christmas, and we're going to be, you know, that sermon series is entitled Companies coming, all right? You like to see company coming for Christmas, don't you? So we're going to look at uh, companies coming for Christmas. And so that's part of our Advent series. Also with Advent, we're going to do something that's uh, perhaps new to, uh, to some of you. We're going to do what's called an Advent wreath. An Advent wreath, it's gonna ha it has 
four candles around and one in the center, and each week we will light a new candle on that wreath, and then Christmas Eve we'll light the, the center candle. And those candles uh, represent uh, peace and joy and hope, those kinds of things. And so, and then the center uh, uh, candle is the Christ candle. And it's, it's, a, it's done in a lot of churches all over the world. And I like the idea of that we can participate in something that is done all over the world, that we are connected with the worldwide church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the fact that we, we speak into Christmas these words of peace and hope and joy and so forth, that this, I think, will uh, help enrich our, our time leading up to Christmas. And so that on, when we come to Christmas, it will be filled with, with more meaning. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we're going to be doing uh, at the beginning of our services in December as well, okay? And then in January, we have Alpha. Alpha is a, a course that we're going to be doing church-wide. All of our small groups are going to be doing church-wide this Alpha course. Alpha being the first letter of the Greek alphabet, right? Alphabet, right? So uh, it's the first letter. So it's the first things of the church. It's the first things about Christ. And so it's a chance for us to get back to our roots and look at what it means for us to be Christians. Why, are, why do we believe what we believe? It's also a great opportunity to invite our friends, our family, our neighbors, our co-workers to come to our, our studies as well so that they can learn about answers to questions that are common. Like the very first question that will be, will be asked uh, is, is there more than this? Is there more than this? Is this life all there is to our existence? And so there are going to be several questions that lead us through what Christians believe, and it gives opportunity for others who don't know Christ to learn what it means to be a Christian and to accept Christ into their lives as well. Now, what this entails, as I said, all of our groups are going to be doing this, and we've set up groups that are going to meet here at the church as well as in different people's homes around the county. And uh, Lori Wilkowski and I have sat for hours and hours and hours looking at names and where we can place people in different classes. And so we have our class leaders or our... Um, facilitators, because it's, it involves a video at the beginning, and then there's questions and so forth. So those who are leading are going to be our facilitators. So look for uh, an invitation from these different facilitators to come and join their group, okay? So we're not going to have a sign up like we normally would. We're going to have this by invitation from the, um, uh, from the facilitators, if it works out that you can go, fantastic. If it, if it doesn't work with your schedule, let us know so that we can put you in a different group that will fit your schedule And well, because we want everybody to participate in this and we want everybody inviting everybody you know as well. So that's what Alpha is coming up uh, and is and when it's coming up in January, that first full week of, of January. So I guess... The first Sunday is the 5th, so that's what we're going to be uh, starting that week. So expect a call from your group leader, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, all join in and, and learn together uh, all these uh, amazing answers to the questions that sometimes, even as Christians, still bug us, right? Sometimes we still have questions. Well, hmm, I'm not sure why well, the church believes that, but that's what the church you know, that's what the Bible teaches, so, you know, I don't know why, but that's what we believe, right? So, let's, let's all learn together, all right? Okay, so, getting into today's sermon, all right? What's next, Lord? Acts 16, and the sermon title for today is Finding Freedom 
in following Christ. Finding freedom in following Christ. A lot of times we think about freedom, oh, well then, I'm not having to follow anybody. I don't have to follow the rules. I have complete freedom. There is greater freedom in following Christ. Okay? So let's get in to Acts 16, verse 1. Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So Paul, now uh, he and Barnabas have have gone their different ways, as uh, Pastor Stephanie uh, talked about last week. And because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and uh, Paul said, no, I don't think so. He, he wasn't really faithful to us last time. So you go with John, uh, you, t- you take John Mark, and you go your way, and I'm going to take Silas, and we're going to go our way. And as they're going, they come upon Timothy, and he takes on Timothy as a protege. And despite traveling with news from the, the Jerusalem council, Paul had Timothy circumcised so that he would be accepted by the Jewish leaders in the cities they were traveling to. It could also uh, have something to do with uh, the fact that it was a a consideration or a qualification for ministry, even though it was not required for inclusion in the church, right? And so... Uh, it could have been something th- that uh, in, in Paul's mind as well. Now, I hope, for Timothy's sake, that he told him ahead of time that <laughs> this was not necessary for inclusion in the church. Can you imagine having been circumcised and then going telling people, you know, you don't have to be circumcised to be part of the church? And Timothy says, say what? <laughs> that would have come as a surprise. But, you know, uh, leaders in the church are often to do asked or are often asked to do more asked to do more challenging and difficult things than uh, than uh, people who are in the congregation who um, uh, who don't necessarily have leadership uh, positions we have to deliberately take on the tasks that are challenging difficult and sometimes even painful for us, because that way leaders gain credibility in their ministry. And so when we look at who is up for ministry, who do we, uh, who do we look at as worthy of being in ministry positions? Who do we look to to lead different ministries? Those who aren't up for the challenges and the difficulties of the church aren't up for leadership in the church. We have to look for those who are willing to take on those responsibilities, willing to do the things that are difficult. You know, I used to be so, so conflict avoidant. I was Mr. Diplomatic. But being in leadership, you have to take on sometimes those moments of conflict. Those moments when you have to say, I'm sorry, that was not the right thing to do. Let's talk about it. We need to, uh, we need to say, you know, this, this is not the way that, that, we, that we act in the church. This is not the way we talk in the church. This is not the way we treat each other in the church. We need to dial it down, whatever we need to say to them. But we need to do that. We need to speak to that conflict. We need to, um, to come forward and, and face it and get rid of that conflict as soon as we can so that it doesn't spread and so that it doesn't uh, disturb the church. 
And so those who aren't up for those challenges aren't up for leadership. So we look for those who are willing to stand up for truth, stand up for Jesus, and stand up for the church for those who are uh, to be in leadership positions. And it says that the, the churches in uh, Derby and Lystra and Iconium were encouraged and strengthened by the decisions of the Jerusalem Council because now they could accept people who weren't circumcised and they were able to grow in numbers even more because there were people who were, were willing to say, oh, you know, I believe all this, but I'm not willing to be a member of the church because I, you know, I don't want to go through circumcision. Now they could also be part of the church. And so the numbers of the church grew, and they were able to include more people uh, in the church. So let's go on. Verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Now, some weird words here. <laughs> some different places that we're not used to pronouncing here. But they were forbidden to speak the Word of God in the province called Asia which is now Western Turkey. It's not the continent of Asia. It's the part of Turkey that's a, you know, a region there, okay, in Western Turkey. And it says they were not allowed to go into Bithynia, which is Northern Turkey. And so you have Northern Turkey, Bithynia, and you have Western Turkey, which is Asia, and they couldn't go into either one. And so they had to travel in this border region. Uh, and they had to go through this kind of no man's land. Think about today and uh, uh, some of the, the borders like with I Iran, or excuse me, Iraq and Turkey, where the Kurds live. And it's kind of a, a nebulous region. Yeah, there's a geographical, line, you know, ma map line. But, you know, the, the, the people are, are a little bit more, sometimes they're more um, loyal to, to Turkey, sometimes they're more uh, um, loyal to, to Iraq, whoever's just, who happens to be there that day sometimes, okay? And so, you know, they're, they're just kind of a no man's land uh, in between there. And they had to travel this way until they reached finally all the way to Troas, which was on the very west coast. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but traveling all the way to the west coast, that can be a scary proposition, even here in the States, right? <laughs> there's, there's some places on the west coast that I did not want to go. But <laughs> they travel all the way to the west coast, and they went as far as they could without circling around and heading back home along the southern border. They had reached the point where they were asking, what's next, Lord? Or where's next? We've gone through this, this no man's land because you wouldn't let us go into Asia. You wouldn't let us go into Bithynia. So we've traveled along. We've gone as far as we could. Where are we going to go next, Lord? What is next? And so, verse 9, we pick up there. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city in the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. 
we sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So here's this vision of a man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia, over in Europe, not no longer in the, uh, the, the continent of, of Asia and we're uh, in that Middle East area, but come over to Macedonia, into Europe, bring the gospel, help us over here in Europe. And here is the reason that Paul and Silas weren't allowed to go into Asia and Bithynia because God was leading them to Macedonia. You see, God's purpose to take them to Macedonia was greater than their desires to go into Asia and Bithynia. God had a better plan for them. And so, I want to ask you, how many times do you feel shut out of a ministry that you think you'd be good at? How many times does the Holy Spirit put up barriers to doing a ministry that you think the church ought to be doing? How many times then afterwards do you thank God that you didn't get sidetracked by something that was good that would keep you from what God has that is great. When God has something better for you, don't, don't get sidetracked by what is good when God has what's great waiting for you. Now also, you'll note in here, verse 6, he says, they. Verse 7, Luke says, they. Verse 8, Luke says, they. And then in verse 10, he turns to we. Luke was no longer just a spectator. He was no longer just a journalist. He started to say, we. We. We went here. We went there. We set sail. Okay? And this is the first of what we call the we passages. Here in chapter 16, also um, later in uh, chapters 20 and 21, and then later in verses 27 and 28. So Luke had been traveling with Paul and Silas and Timothy, okay? And uh, he was traveling with them, but this time he's going with them in perhaps a more official Capacity. He is now joining the team, perhaps as the, the team doctor, because he was a physician. And so this tells me that there are seasons, there are times when we can sit back and be a spectator or a journalist and watch what's going on. But there are also seasons and times when God calls us to be directly involved, where we need to be directly involved in what's going on. We need to step up and be members of the team. It's like when you're sitting on the sidelines at a football game, you're sitting on the bench and you're watching the game, but you've got to keep your head in the game because you need to know what's going on, especially for the position that you play, even though you may be a backup. Okay, you have to watch how, uh, if, let's just say you're uh, uh, a left guard, somebody on the offensive line, okay? You have to watch the guy who's playing left guard ahead of you and see how the person who's coming at him trying to come through that line, you have to watch how they interact. You have to watch what's going on in that particular aspect of the game. And then 
that guy needs a breather or that guy gets injured and it's your time to step up because you're part of the team and you need to be directly involved. You need to know how that defense guy is going to be trying to get by you to get at the quarterback. You need to know what kind of moves he will do. You need to know how to block him. You need to know how to do the footwork that's going to be that's going to set you right in a position to make the, the moves that you need to move to keep your uh, quarterback protected. You need to be ready and willing to go when the call comes. And use your gifts and talents in meaningful ways. And so, I encourage you, always be ready. Always be ready. You never know when the call is coming to step up and take part in the ministry and to be ready to know what to do, how to do it, and to learn even more once you get in there, okay? So, there are times that we can say they are doing great things, but it's important that you don't miss out on the times when God is calling you to step up and to join the party, right? Now, when, upon receiving the call to Macedonia, when they got the call to go over to Greece, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke immediately made plans to go. Immediately. As soon as the call came, they were ready. And they stepped up and they were ready to go, recognizing that one, God had called us, two, to preach the gospel, and three, to them. There's three different aspects of this calling. It was God calling us. It wasn't our desires. It wasn't what we planned. We had planned to go into Asia and Bithynia. But now God is calling us to go over into Europe, into Greece. And there was a reason, our mission. The mission was to preach the gospel. We were we were not there to do um, relief work. We were not there to encourage churches that were already established like we did in Derby and Lystra and Iconium. No, we were called to preach the gospel. This is a new territory. There, we need to go to uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because th there may be Jewish uh, people over there, but they don't know about Jesus yet. They have not received Jesus so we need to preach the gospel to them, not to anybody else, not in Asia, not in Bithynia, to them. They are the intended audience. And so they have been previously restricted, but now they were finding freedom. You see, there is sometimes freedom in those restrictions. And now they're free to follow, uh, one, God's call, two, the mission that God has called them to, and three, to God's intended audience. And guess what? So are you. You are also freed up to answer God's call, to uh, to do the mission that he calls or the task that he calls you to do and you are called to a specific time or a people to do the, this ministry among. And so you are freed up to do those. We don't sit here and say, oh no, you can't do that. You can't be a part of this ministry in this town because we're not sanctioning that. No, you are freed up to minister as God calls you to do. Let's go on. Verse 16. Once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, or again us, Luke is included, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. And she did this for many days. And you can imagine, well, okay, it's nice to get some recognition, right? Let's continue. 
Paul was greatly annoyed <laughs> because she kept doing this for many, many days. Turning to the Spirit. Now, notice he's not saying turning to the young woman, not turning to this girl, but turning to the Spirit who was in her. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothing or their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the, in the stocks. So once they got to Macedonia, they brought the gospel and they converted Lydia, which we read in the last section there. They converted Lydia, this woman who was a, uh, a, uh, a, a merchant who sold purple cloth, which was expensive in those days. And she became then a faithful partner in their ministry, a faithful supporter of theirs, and helped them with uh, various things that they wanted to accomplish. So she was a supporter of their ministry because she believed in the message of Jesus. They also brought the gospel and then cast out a demon from this young girl. So they converted uh, Lydia and they cast out a demon. And again, this ministry involves challenging tasks, okay? They could have just said, okay, ignore her, she'll go away, okay? But no, Paul turned to that spirit and confronted that spirit. And so ministry involves challenging tasks that you and I have to be ready to face and to take on, including the very real ministry of spiritual warfare, now, this week I had a conversation with, with someone in our church who had experienced seeing demons cast out for the very first time in their life. They saw this. And we got talking about it and said, yeah, it's not metaphorical. It's not something that's just we talk about, you know, as a spiritual principle or whatever. No, it is very, very real. The spiritual warfare that goes on is very real. And so when we pray, we need to take prayer seriously. When we talk to God, we take that very seriously. And we have to also watch out for the attacks of Satan because those are very real as well. And we need to Holy, the Holy Spirit in our lives to, to ward off those attacks. We need the full armor of God that we talked about earlier, earlier this year, that we need to be ready to ward off those attacks from Satan because those attacks are very real. And so they went into Macedonia. They did conversion of, uh, of by preaching the gospel to people who had not heard the, the gospel of Jesus. And they cast out a demon. And what did they get in uh, in? Uh, response to their efforts. What was their reward? Well, they were thrown into prison. Well, um, not ex exactly what we were expecting. And But here, let me ask you this. When will these people learn? <laughs> when will these people learn? Okay, Jesus did not stay in the grave and his apostles didn't stay in prison. Okay, Peter and, and John had uh, been rescued from prison before. Paul had been rescued. So Paul and Silas, they're in prison. Why, why, why do you think they're going to stay there? <laughs> why do you think they're, even if you put them in the inner prison, why do you think you're going to be able to hold them there? Well, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying 
and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Now notice in verse 25 that it says, Paul and Silas were praying and they started singing hymns. And what? And the prisoners were listening to them. Did you catch that? Paul and Silas were singing, and the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas weren't prisoners. Yes, they were locked up. They were inside the prison walls, but they weren't prisoners. They were freed up. They were free to minister even though they were locked up and they were in chains and bonds, they may have been locked up on the outside, but that didn't stop them. But, 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 but yeah, I speak for a living. <laughs> they may have been locked up, but that didn't stop them from being freed up on the inside. Okay? They were locked up on the outside, but freed up on the inside. Some years ago, when my wife and I uh, were part of a, a, a church down in Kentucky, that uh, we were part of the Christmas choir that they had every year, and, and the highlight of that Christmas choir was not singing at the different um, uh, concerts that we gave at the church, because sometimes we built up to where we were doing four nights in one week. Uh, and they had like a dinner theater uh, kind of thing. So the choir was singing four nights. And, but we also went down uh, to uh, a place called Renfro Valley, which is kind of like Kentucky's version of the Grand Ole Opry, a little bit smaller scale, obviously. <laughs> but we went down there. We, we sang at uh, some public places, you know, in the area. But the... The, the place that was the highlight for all of us was going into the maximum security prison on a Sunday afternoon and singing our concert to those folks. Because let me tell you, they were locked up on the outside, but they were freed up on the inside. They knew how to worship. They knew what it was to be in bonds. They knew what it was to be trapped but they also knew the freedom that they had found in Christ. And so they were free to worship, and we would worship with them for a while, and then we would give our concert, and they would just pour their hearts out. And uh, we just had, it was like the highlight of our year, every year for that Christmas choir, was to go where people were locked up, but yet they were also freed up. And that's how it was with Paul and Silas. And then the angels came and shook that place. They shook the jailhouse. And sometimes to change the house, as we say around here, change the house, sometimes to change the house, you have to shake the house. Sometimes we need a little shake up to wake us up and to realize that change is coming, that God wants to free us up 
for what he's calling us to. And when the angels shook the house, a lot more people than just Paul and Silas and, uh, and, and Timothy and Luke, a lot more than them experienced freedom. Paul and Silas, their chains fell off, and they were delivered from prison. They were freed from prison. But the jailer also and his entire household were freed up from the grip of Satan, freed up from the sins in their lives, freed up from eternity without God, freed up from eternity in hell. What a time to celebrate, to know that you are free from those chains that would, uh, that would uh, curse you and those, those, uh, those grips of Satan that would doom you for eternity. That's time to celebrate. That's time to know the freedom and, and enjoy the freedom of Christ. He knew that he was free. He knew that he didn't have to live uh, according to his uh, old ways. He could have new life in Christ. And so what's next, Lord? What's next in this, this freedom? How can we find freedom in following Christ? Rather than doing whatever we want, there is freedom in following Christ. We find freedom in ministry when we allow the Holy Spirit to challenge us and to challenge others in productive ways. And that freezes a church to grow in healthy ways, right? If we're just bickering with one another, that's not healthy. But if we are in love, freely confronting what is going on and expressing that in a loving way, then there is freedom. There is productivity, and there is healthiness within the church. Sometimes we're, we're, we find freedom in what we're not allowed to do, right? Paul and Silas were not allowed to go into Asia and Bithynia. We find freedom in what we're not allowed to do so that we can now do what God has called us to do, greater things. We find freedom to fo follow God's call, God's mission, and, go and to seek out God's intended audience. We find freedom in following Christ to bring the gospel to others, even when we're in unfavorable circumstances, like prison. <laughs> I don't know if there's uh, much more of an unfavorable condition, but Paul and Silas, they were freed up. God can still use you and bring freedom to others, even your supposed enemies. God can free you up to do new ministry because, let's face it, folks, there is no greater freedom than the freedom in, that is found in following Christ. So if, if you are a believer, I don't want you to feel chained up. I don't want you to feel bound up. I want you to know God's freedom. I want you to experience freedom in following Christ and what he's calling you to do. If you're here this morning and don't know Jesus as your Savior, by all means, come on, let's, let's get uh, that taken care of. Let's uh, begin this walk of following Christ. And so as we, uh, as we stand now, as we sing this last song called the, Great Com or called the Commission, if you feel God is calling you into ministry, if you feel God is calling you to follow him for the first time, Come on, let's, let's pray and let's meet God together, all right? Let's stand and sing.